I often find it amazing how year after year, when we hear the scripture readings at Mass, they take on a, a new meaning. And the reason for that is that every year we've changed. Every year we're in a different place under different circumstances. And so we hear the scripture readings in a new way. And a good example of that is in the opening line of today's gospel, where we are told that the apostles were behind locked doors, sequestered because of fear. Now that sounds rather familiar to all of us, I think, because this year, you and I, for the past several weeks, have been living with a type of, of fear and if you're hearing me uh, this morning um, via live streaming, you are doing so behind doors in your home um, because of the precautions that we're taking. And so we hear these readings this year with new ears, with new circumstances. Perhaps then one of the blessings of this Sunday, this Divine Mercy Sunday, is that we are assured that the risen Christ comes to us. He comes looking for us personally, coming to us in our fear, whatever that fear may be. It may be a fear of this virus. It may be a fear of uh, economic uncertainty. And there are other things, too, in our lives that, that bring concern and fear. But in all of this, Christ comes to us in his mercy. He seeks us in his mercy. Often when someone is looking for us, it's maybe not good news. Uh, if you're told that the police are looking for you, for example, it's probably not a good thing. But if you're lost, if you're lost at sea or in the wilderness, if you're a child who's lost, you hope someone is looking for you. The gospel tells us that God in his mercy is looking for us, searching for us. Jesus looks for and finds his apostles on this Easter evening that we hear recounted in the gospel today. And he does something remarkable when he finds his apostles. He greets them with peace. He meets their fear with the gift of peace. And then he does something even more remarkable. He gives them what we might call a mini Pentecost experience. Now you'll recall that the Pentecost that we typically think of occurred in the upper room with the disciples and even Mary, the mother of Jesus, and they had been praying. And on the Pentecost that we typically celebrate 50 days after Easter, we recall that event of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in which tongues of fire came down upon all, all of them and they began to speak in different languages. But on this occasion, too, there's what we might recognize as a, a miniature Pentecost. Here, too, Jesus sends his apostles forth. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then notice what comes next. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. We sometimes forget what it was that got Jesus killed. Do you remember? Why did they crucify Jesus? The Jewish leaders were upset because he claimed authority to forgive sins. They said no one can forgive sins but God alone. And that's true. Jesus is true God and true man. And on this occasion, Jesus is giving his apostles, his first priests and bishops, the same authority to forgive sins. 
which is his authority as God, and he does this by giving them the Holy Spirit. And he sends them out to continue the same mission that he received from his Father. As the Father sent me, so I send you. So the apostles are told on this occasion by Jesus himself that they are now commissioned to do what Jesus did, to forgive sins, to set people free, to set people free from what we might call the old regime, the old kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, and to usher people into a new kingdom, the kingdom of light, with a life of freedom that comes from dying and rising with Christ and belonging to Christ as a member of his body. Once one is freed to live this new life, what does it look like? It's described in the first reading that we had today from the Acts of the Apostles. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. All who believed were together and had all things in common, and every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. That ought to sound familiar to us because it describes the essence of church life today. They devoted themselves to living by the teaching of the apostles. Well, what is that? Well, it's what we read about in the scriptures, but it's also handed on to us in the tradition, with a capital T, of the church, the Christian life that's handed on to the apostles by Christ. They also came together in a communal way of life to celebrate the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, and the sacraments. We also see in the, the early church and today how charity is lived out among those who follow Christ. So this description in the Acts of the Apostles is what the church really ought to look like in every age. And so we're called to recommit ourselves to living out that life of freedom in Christ. What was the outcome of this way of life? What effect did it have on the broader culture? We are told that too. Every day the Lord added to their, their number those who were being saved. If the church is living out this new life of freedom in Christ, it's attractive. It's attractive to others. That's the base, basis of the church's missionary activity is to simply live authentically this new life in Christ of sharing things in common, making sure people have enough, a life of charity with one another in common, a life of living by the teaching of Christ handed on to us, and a life of celebrating the Eucharist and the sacraments, the mysteries. After this occasion that we heard about in the Gospels today, the danger didn't go away. It was still there. Once they received this mission from Christ, the danger didn't diminish. In fact, all of them, save St. John, were martyred eventually. But something changed for the apostles. They were no longer afraid. They received the peace of Christ. So as we celebrate this Divine Mercy Sunday, maybe that is one of the gifts that we are meant to receive too. Even St. Peter in the second reading does not dodge the fact that, as he says, for a little while you may have to suffer through various trials. He also says that this is for a purpose, so that your faith, more precious than gold, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that this faith leads to the attainment of a goal, the salvation of your souls. Maybe you've noticed, as I have, 
at how many commercials on radio or television now begin with these or similar words, in these uncertain times. While that is true, that this crisis that we're living in brings uncertainty, there really never is a time in human life where there is not some danger or threat or something to worry about. This Divine Mercy Sunday assures us that God's love for us in Christ is certain. There's no uncertainty about that. The Psalm today, Psalm 118, repeats again and again, His mercy endures forever. The wounds of Christ, which St. Thomas insisted on seeing and touching, show us that this mercy that we are offered is not trivial. It came at the cost of Jesus' crucifixion. He paid a price for our sins. Let us receive his divine mercy, realizing what St. Thomas did, that it comes to us from our Lord and our God as a precious gift, the price paid to set us free so that we could live without sin or fear and in peace. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 